Transfiguration Sunday. The transfiguration, the changing of Christ. This can be a tough Sunday to figure out. I mean, it is almost as startling, almost as mysterious as Easter morning, right? With the empty tomb and the risen Christ. And yet, it also serves as a, a bit of a transitional function. All the gospel passages of the season of Advent and Christmas up to Epiphany Sunday, they all point to Jesus as God's agent in these new ap ap apocalyptic, that's a hard, to, hard one to say some mornings, as God's agent in these apocalyptic times about the transformation of the world from the old age to the new age. And the text, the texts rather on all the Sundays after Epiphany Sunday until today, they emphasize Jesus' teaching about the nature of God's kingdom and how to live in its light. And so the story of the transfiguration, which we celebrate this morning, climaxes the season of a, after Epiphany by demonstrating the truth of all of those claims of Advent and Christmas and yes, even Easter. Jesus is indeed the agent of the kingdom, the Messiah, and the aspects of the future world, of the future kingdom to come, are already present. Lent, a season of theological reflection, it begins on Ash Wednesday, right? It begins on this coming Wednesday, immediately after the transfiguration. So the transfiguration offers a vision for the future that will sustain us through those sober, reflective days of Lent as we draw nearer and nearer to the Passion Week, to the Holy Week. This image of the transfigured Jesus, it offers us not only a way of speaking about Jesus, but also an image for the church in a season of struggle right, of struggle within the church and perhaps within the culture. Any encounter with Jesus should leave an individual or the church transfigured, present in the old age, but shining with the light of the new, just like Jesus. And I think that we intuitively understand transfiguration in our lives as we have aged, those moments when a new truth or a new reality is suddenly revealed or confirmed or thrust upon us, when life as we know it changes. Marriage, for one, right? We often anticipate it, we plan it, but it is nevertheless over in the blink of an eye and suddenly life is different. We still remember it, we, we celebrate it every year with anniversaries, we flip through the photo albums and look at the pictures and go, oh, look at that, remember when, and we tell stories. But the moment itself, it's transformative and it is fleeting. You could argue that the birth of a child, especially your first child, is the same type of thing, right? Nine months of anticipation, of planning and preparing, and suddenly the water breaks and there's a mad rush to get to the hospital, and then likely more waiting, and then suddenly the miracle and pain of birth with a newborn baby placed in your arms. A beautiful, fleeting moment but also a moment which completely transforms life as you knew it. A moment remembered and celebrated every year on the child's birthday, and yet a moment that is also continually transforming your life as time passes, right? And so just like marriages, just like babies, just like other mountaintop experiences that have the power to transform our lives, there's also a temptation to fixate on that moment, to not want to leave it, because we all know that coming down from the mountain, that's a tough place to be, right? To go from here to here, to go from new baby to diapers and tiredness and mess and I don't know where my day went, or to the real work of marriage from that celebration of it or that moment when discipleship begins in our story today. P. 
Peter's example, it serves to remind us that we can become so fixated on the moment itself that we want to stay there and build some houses. We want to remain in the moment. He wants to remain there so much that he fixates on that offer that God made in the moment. And then he forgets to obey God. And this has been a continuous problem for the people of God. And it is written about in all the books of the prophets. God does not care about our offerings when we are not living our entire lives as an offering. Right? Especially when what we do actually hurts other people. Listen to him. Do not be afraid. These are both messages and commands of God. One does not cancel the other one out. In fact, the cloud of God's presence may be gone. Jesus, his his dazzling brightness may have toned down. But Jesus is still present in our midst. He was present in theirs as they climbed down off the mountain and he remains in ours today. And sometimes comfort and compassion, it can be just as overwhelming as terror or fright. It can be just as awe-inducing, which is another way of understanding that phrase, the fear of God, right? The disciples, they have surely seen some things already as they've been with Jesus over the last three years. And they've even been physically part of some of them. They might have thought that they'd already been in it. They're already part of it. But now these three are keenly aware that there is so much more to God's glory and to God's purpose and design and call on their lives. In the verses that immediately follow our text today, we're told that the disciples have now have some greater insight as they ask Jesus about Elijah and the prophecy that he must come first. And in the exchange, they understand that John the Baptist has played a key role in Jesus' purposes. It's one of the few times in the Gospels that the disciples actually seem to understand something quickly and easily, right? That light bulb goes on almost immediately. It's as though seeing the transfiguration being ministered to by both Yahweh and Jesus. And might we think of the cloud as the Holy Spirit's presence? It has given the disciples eyes to see and ears to hear and minds to understand what Jesus is saying and the light bulb goes on. In other words, by being with God, by knowing God's kindness, they are disposed or predisposed to to obedience and understanding. We often overlook the two-word command that Jesus gives immediately after, do not be afraid. We have an equally loaded command here, at least in biblical terms, to get up. Jesus does not leave them lying face down there on the mountaintop and go whistling away as down the mountain by himself. He turns to them and he touches them and he says, get up, arise. When he uses those words, he's using the same words that he uses when he raises people from the dead. It is like, arise, you are born again. You have new life. For they may just find themselves in the midst of something unlike they have ever experienced before. They may be so afraid that they are as paralyzed as though they were in fact dead but he does not leave them there dead in their terror or their confusion. He tells them to get up and to leave their fear behind. I always feel inadequate every year when I preach the transfiguration. And maybe, maybe that's the whole point. Maybe we human proclaimers of this amazing story will always stand in awe, unable to completely describe it. For if we were fully aware of what is now before us, we would be face down on the ground trembling in fear as well. But even to us, Jesus says, get up, arise, leave that fear behind. Even to us, I expect Jesus is telling me to stand up, 
to dare to speak about it anyway, even if you feel you're inadequate. I may not get it quite right, but even my meager attempts, they point to the majesty and the wonder of Jesus as we witness it in this story and a story that perhaps the world needs, particularly in these times and places. How many times do we hear Jesus tell someone he has healed to get up, to get on with living in the power of the forgiveness of sin? Right? Get up, dust yourself off, enjoy this new life. Live this new life fully. Do what you are called to do. Be a child of God. Friends, ministry and faith can be hard. And I'm not just not talking about ordained ministry done by clergy like me. I'm talking about the proclamation of the gospel that we are all called to do. I'm talking about sharing our belief in Jesus Christ with a world that is far more cynical and disbelieving than perhaps at any time in human history. And yet, also a world that so desperately needs to hear it. It's quite the paradox, isn't it? And that can be a lonely and difficult place to be. And so sometimes, sometimes we need those glimpses of the mountaintop. We need the memories of those moments, those emotions, those hopes, those dreams, those things that help make us a better spouse or a better parent or a better disciple. Too often we find ourselves without cherished companions who can help us remember what perhaps we knew so well in that instant on the mountaintop along with Peter and James and John and Moses and Elijah and Jesus, always Jesus. Friends, ministry and life, they can be hard. And yet through it all, sometimes in profoundly unexpected times, we are pulled up out of the difficulty and find ourselves right back up on the mountaintop where again we are privileged to see Jesus transfigured before us, shining like the sun itself. And in those moments we remember, we remember why we are here, why we do what we do. And somehow, with that to carry us, we are able to join Jesus in going back down the mountain. We are able to join with God's beloved people in times and places where they also find that yearning for the kind of understanding and hope which we too often only receive when we've been on the mountaintop. Gosh, how we miss it. And so, I'd like to share one story of that with you because it is a story that reminds me of why I entered ministry in the first place. It's a story that reminds me about why we as a congregation keep struggling and forging ahead, about why we keep teaching and telling and persevering. It's a story that reminds me why we must continue to find new ways to share the gospel, to keep picking ourselves up and dusting ourselves off because Jesus is still commanding us to get up and not be afraid. I was told this, Sunday, this story after church last Sunday and I've received permission from both involved parties to share it with you. Tavish Clendenning is a nine-year-old boy in our congregation and the middle child of Melanie and Andrew. Madison Monroe Podolinsky is a member of our congregation, and she's also a teacher at a local elementary school, the same school that Tavish attends. Tavish was overheard by another teacher at the school telling other kids that he was related to Mrs. Podolinsky. Now, being a small town, most of us know who's related to who and how. And the teacher was pretty sure that Tavish was not related to Mrs. Podolinsky. So the teacher checked and sure enough, he wasn't. So Mrs. Podolinsky said, I'll I'll talk to Tavish. And so when she pulled him aside to ask Tavish why he was telling people that they were related when they weren't, Tavish replied, but we are, we're church family, right? 
I'm sure you just had the same reaction that I did when I heard it for the first time and speaking it now again to you. Friends, my prayer for each and for all of us is that you might, you might receive enough of these little gifts, of these little reminders of mountaintop experiences, these little glimpses of the kingdom that we can carry on, that we can persevere, that we can get up, that we cannot be afraid. That we might be reminded that what we receive on the mountaintop will sustain us through all of those hard days of slogging and loneliness and confusion. Days which come to all who seek to follow Jesus, who seek to be God's, who seek to be Jesus' disciples. And so may we all be cloaked in the wonder of transfiguration, in the wonder of those mountaintop experiences. And may they sustain us now and forevermore. Amen. Our hymn, 185, Jesus on the Mountain Peak, and it's sung by Marianne McVicker. <laughs>